Hi, I'm Russ Segner. We put this series together to feature narrow gauge layouts, seldom seen because they are not located in cities where we normally visit for national narrow gauge conventions. Thanks to the organizing committee of Jerry Cornwell, Pete Smith, Mark Lachey, Dave Adams, and Jeff Schultz. Information in this program is available at NNG at groups Dot io. We hope you will join us. So now for our program. Pete Smith, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our next guest. Right. Thank you, Mark. Um, our second presentation is going to be a clinic. And Dave Adams will discuss uh, his lessons learned during 23 years of formal operations on the ON3 Durland branch layout, which is his ON3 layout. The clinic is about the hosting of and the participation in operating sessions. But let me first give you a little background on Dave. Uh, as Russ had mentioned earlier, Dave is one of the crew that put together this series of pre Zoom presentations and we thank him for his effort. Um, he is, um, uh, lives in San Jose, California. He's been modeling in the, the Bay Area since the age of five, which is really early. And, uh, but he, in 1974, he discovered narrow gauge. And so he moved off of HO standard gauge and switched to ON3. And he's stuck with that uh, scale ever since. Uh, during that time, he was also active with a privately owned 15 inch live steam gauge, uh, five inch scale railroad. And he's hung with those guys for about 30 years. Um, all this time, realistic operation has always been one of uh, Dave's interests, but he really got serious about it in 96 after researching the operations systems on the DNRGW. Uh, timetable and train order operations since that time became a real priority on his own railroad, and he says that's what really made the hobby really enjoyable for him. And Dave will now share some of his experiences with us on that subject. Dave, take it. So if you see the title slide, it should say something like lessons learned with a question mark. We, we so, have that, Dave. So all you're right. Good to go. we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed. So for the frame, a frame of reference of what's this 23 years, uh, that really means the formal operation started uh, on, the, on the railroad with employee timetable number one, which was effective June 1, 1997. And that this was sort of the launch of, uh, of can we really make timetable and train order stuff work? And uh, later on that year, as I ended up hosting a bunch of folks from out of town that actually knew this stuff. So this was sort of a trial run with the locals here to see, see what we could do and how it would go. And uh, what I'm gonna be talking about for the rest of this is basically what I've learned and what all's happened in uh, in that span of time since uh, <laughs> June 1997 and, and now. Uh, the other thing is, is for you guys that, uh, that basically host operating sessions and things of this sort, I've borrowed a lot of ideas from others in the hobby. So you may have heard some of this or a lot of it before. Okay, a little bit about the uh, about the railroad that, uh, that I've practiced on here. And that's uh, ON3, I call it the Durland branch. It's uh, Freelance branch line was seen in the Rio Grande Fourth Division. Uh, we run 280s, 282s, 460s, 30 foot wooden freight cars, and approximately 40 foot wooden passenger cars. The, uh, I'm, I have adopted about a 1920s traffic operating pattern from the Rio Grande. And this is basically from researching um, all, all the employee timetables I could get there, my hands on from the period. And so we've stolen things from the Crested Butte branch, the Uray branch, the Lake City branches, and also from the Durango to Alamosa mainline. And the other thing we've included in the railroad is, is a helper district that's based on the district from Chama to Cumbers. So in, in summary, what I've attempted to do is capture indoors the small steam engine, timetable and train order, and a mountain operations experience. The uh, layout itself isn't too complicated. Um, the heart of it turns out to be Chama. And uh, Chama, obviously, uh, to, your, to the east is Alamosa, to the west is Durango. In uh, real life, the uh, the uh, Alamosa and Durango are the same thing. They're basically a staging yard. 
where things start to get interesting is at Grant Line Junction, because that's where the branch starts out of Chama. And it heads up through Cresco, up a 4% grade up to Corumba. Uh, and then at Corumba, the line continues on to Fritz Park, Resin Creek, and down into Durland. Also out of Corumba, there is a, um, uh, a reverse move that basically gets you into Flint, which is another, another mythical town. So this is essentially what, uh, what the stage that we've uh, adapted timetable and train order to. Okay, good, now that I have that. Okay, so as far as operations are concerned, as I, I, uh, I looked at this as just another aspect of the prototype to research. And the other thing I discovered while doing that thing is, is, is happy coincidence, you stumble along, along information that basically helps you out with other modeling projects. And uh, the interesting part about this is, is that to discover stuff to help out other modeling projects, I wouldn't have thought to look there. But it, but it didn't. So that's, that's just sort of a kind of a benefit of uh, adding that to the, uh, to what you pursue in the hobby here. As I said, I, I found this is an enjoyable part of the hobby for me, and it's and it's not as scary as it seems as first first glance. Uh, the advantage is you can implement it, and it can be learned in phases. You can implement it in phases. Uh, the other thing that you figure out is improvement is an iterative process. You just keep doing it and you get better at it and everybody else gets better at it that's uh, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in, the, in the game with you. Uh, the other thing is, is you have a chance to meet some really great people that are, that, that are operators. <clears throat> so I've, I've had the chance to operate on railroads all over the U.S. and uh, a lot of them not narrow gauge, but timetable and train order was uh, kind of an industry standard back in the day. And it didn't make any difference whether whether you were the Denver Rio Grande, the CNS, uh, or the Southern Pacific or the Norfolk and Western. It was uh, timetable and train order was was what you, what you ran until you got the more modern control systems in here. The uh, advantage of the operations end of the game is it's really a low dollar cost, unlike other parts of the hobby, but it will gobble up as much time as you care to invest. And the other the other thing that uh, always comes to, to the light is people that are operators and layout builders, they say, man, getting the operation experience sure helps you with layouts designed. And the good news about that is you can gain operations experience usually on the other guy's railroad before you've got to commit to plywood and bench work and, and, and track. The other thing that you figure it out that there's expectations, both implicit and explicit, that have to be met by a layout host and visiting operators if an operation session, operating session is to be uh, successful. So if you're, if you're a host and you've built a layout and you're gonna host an operating session, what you can expect is, is to learn something about your physical plant. There's, there's nothing like having friends and other people over to try and run trains with you to teach you how, how robust your plant is. You're also gonna learn different ways of getting the job done. You may have switched out this town dozens of times and, and they've got it down and figured everybody's gonna do it like that. Well, it turns out they won't. And some of the ways they do it are a whole lot slicker than what you may have been doing. That's the other thing you're gonna discover. Um, you're going to get some really constructive feedback from folks on that. Um, you're going to have fun. And the other thing is, if you keep at it, you're going to see the sessions get better over time. On the other hand, as the host is, you really expect the crew to kind of support the operating scheme that you, you put, in, uh, put in place here. And I'll say a bit more about that later. Okay, homework for the host. Um, well, you're going to need reliable track work, rolling stock, and a reliable electrical control system. The other thing you might want to think about, and I did this on my railroad because it's not all that large, is animation and sound. Both of these things can be used to extend the run and add, if you will, more play value to an operating session. Uh, the other thing you'll have to have is a method or methods of communication during the system. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, you're going to need a car forwarding system which is nothing more than which cars go to what destinations. 
in my case, I like car cards and waybills, so that's what we use. Uh, other people use handwritten switch lists. Other people use congener generated computer generated switch lists. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, you've just got a way to help crews understand where this car is supposed to go. Um, you're going to need a traffic plan or a train lineup, which really is how are the cars going to get from where they are to, to where they are supposed to go on that. And you're going to need a traffic control method, which is how do you have these trains interact e with each other in a, in a safe manner. You're going to need to prepare some minimum documentation for the above three items for the crew. And you're also going to want to probably have a spiral notebook or something like that to collect feedback and bad order reports that, uh, as a result of the session. Because you can then refer back to this to use that to uh, um, improve things for the next session. OK, more homework for the host. Uh, how many people do you need to have show up? How long is the session going to run? If you got a, a, a format for putting out a crew call, it's going to tell them, you know, what's the arrival window? When's the session going to get started? <laughs> when do you think it's going to end? Uh, and, th and these sorts of things. Then you're, if, if folks haven't been through this before, or if you've got newcomers to this session, you're going to want to email out some of the railroad documentation that somebody may need to know uh, to be successful in the session. Uh, you'll need to add, designate a place for a crew lounge area because not not every every operator is going to be busy all the time. And if they're waiting for their, another call for another train, uh, they've got to have some place to hang out that's not going to be in the way of every every everyone else. Uh, you'll need to make some decisions. Are you going to allow food and beverages in the layout room? Are you going to have a lunch break? Or are you going to take some other social time? And then you'll have to have plans of an introduction to the session and also how you're going to assign crews to what jobs. And a, and a great way to get a handle on this is to get experience as a, as a guest crew member on other people's railroads. OK, now, if you're a guest crew member, you can expect to learn something new. You're going to help bring the railroad to life as envisioned by the host. You, you have a role to play in, in this. And you're going to be supported by the host and, and his crew helpers. And you're going to have fun. I mean, I've, I haven't been to a session that I haven't had uh, fun yet. Even if I was a little bit confused and apprehensive and behind the eight ball, it still turned out to be a, be a good experience. OK, so here's what a crew gets to bring to a session. Basic knowledge of railroad operations. Uh, you're going to need to bring your skills in controlling a model locomotive or a train to mimic the real thing. You're going to want to have a basic understanding of any of the pre-session materials the host may have provided beforehand on that. Uh, some hosts do that, others don't, uh, and you just, you know, lift the thing from the ground up on the day of the session. Um, and the other thing that you're going to want to bring to the uh, bring, the session is a desire to help the layout host achieve their operating vision for, for the empire they've built. OK, this is just kind of a list of do's and don'ts that uh, have, have uh, been around and I've experienced and other people have experienced or have told me about. And that's uh, the, and these are really common sense, common courtesy kind of things, you know. <laughs> Do show up on time. If you if you don't, make sure the the host knows uh, you know that you're going to be late and about when you might arrive. That's going to help him plan things. Uh, if you need help, uh, ask for it. If you're not sure, don't make it up. Ask for help. You know, do your best to emulate the prototype practices for for the era. Uh, observe and fit in with the tone of the session. Uh, my five hosted sessions that that the guys were here to run serious timetable and train order and and that's exactly what they did. We've had other sessions where banner chat, uh, uh, good time was had by all and we still got the job done. And so, you know, the group kind of picks the tone and tenor of this on that. And uh, as the host, if you can figure out how to go with the flow, you're gonna, you're gonna be great. If you're a crew member, figure out how to fit in with the flow. Uh, if you break something, let the host know on that. I mean, it's embarrassing, but if the host doesn't know about it, uh, that may be a problem for the next session. Um, enjoy yourself. And the other thing is, yeah, it's always nice to thank the host if you had a good time when you leave. 
uh, you know, things to avoid. Don't show up uninvited. <laughs> don't bring a guest <laughs> without the host's knowledge, you know. Uh, don't blow in for the session and then in the middle of it say, gee whiz, I forgot I have an important appointment somewhere. I got to go somewhere else because you probably just loused up crew assignments and things to finish up the session. So, yeah, that's uh, if you if you've got to leave early, just let the host know so he can, again, make arrangements. Just don't up and depart. Um, the other thing is, if it's in my case, it's Denverville Grand Western, uh, somebody that shows up and said, well, let me show you how the New York Central got trains over the road. Well, that's not what we're trying to do here. So if, if you've got a favorite prototype, um, please don't impose your, your, those practices on your, on your host railroad unless that happens to be the prototype. Um, the business with models, and I've, I've uh, have been on this. I tell people is if you've got a problem, I'll, I'll come and fix it. I'd rather break my own toys than have you break them and feel bad about them. Um, so th this is varies from owner to owner and also guest to guest, but this this is it. Don't, don't feel bashful about asking a host or, or a guest crew to put something back on the track. Um, and the other thing is, is when the session's over, check your pockets to make sure you aren't carrying off card cards and coupling picks and, and other kinds of things. That does happen. And uh, we have had, I have had session that I was running three of them in a, in a row on consecutive days. And during the reset, I discovered I was missing a whole batch of card cards. So I had to sit down and recreate all of those from scratch that night in order to set up the session for the next day. Early the next morning before the session started, a gentleman, I, there was a knock at the door <laughs> and the gentleman showed up and he said, I think you're going to need these today. And what he had was this whole pocket of car cards I just recreated the night before. So, so to avoid those kinds of things is a uh, pocket check is always a good idea. Um, in an operating session, there's a, there's a really kind of a cycle that goes on and it starts with a host and that's... <clears throat> the host getting the railroad set up and any bad order items repaired. Then it's getting out the crew call, finding out who can come. The crew sends RSVPs. Yep, I can make it. No, I can't. Uh, then the, the, the host has got to take a look at it and say, boy, have I got enough guys to make the session go. If not, then you contact some more model railroad friends and you keep going until you've got your crew filled out. Um, on the day of the session, you, you know, you've told them about the crew arrival window, people start showing up. Uh, then at the appointed uh, welcome and briefing time, as you get that started, you get the uh, crew members signed up for the various jobs. You get your operations started. They typically will start slowly, but things pick up momentum. And then you realize partway this, through the session is, man, we're really railroading here. And then toward the end, things start winding down as the locals are coming back into town on that. People are getting tired. You've probably been running for two and a half, three hours, and folks are looking for a break. And at that point, you run the debrief, and you capture what happened, what worked, what didn't work, what broke, et cetera. And then it goes back to the host again, and it starts all over again for the next, uh, next session. The other thing about operating sessions is there's, there's always a feeling a little bit apprehensive. If you're a guest operator, um, you know, you, you don't want to screw the session up for everybody else. If you're the host, you want your railroad to hang in there and, and, and be reliable so, so folks have a good time at the session and they aren't fighting gremlins. So it's, it's natural every time uh, you go to a session or you start up a session, there's going to be some butterflies. Now, the best way to lower the apprehension is to be a student, study and learn it. Keep practicing, operate every chance you get, and chase the mechanical and electrical gremlins out of the railroad. The good news about operations are is mistakes are going to be made. But in model railroad ops, unlike the prototype, nobody dies. OK, a little bit about how does a crew know what to do? Well, you've got the real guys that do it on a daily basis. That's experience, plus the rule book, timetable, and train orders and everything else that goes with a, you know, that kind of a real job. In the case of models, I, uh, they've got something that people call train procedures. And the train procedure, and in my case, is, is a um, a linear list that basically covers the, the, the entire trip of a particular train uh, from terminal to its other terminal. It describes the activity or what is to be done at each point on the railroad. It doesn't tell you how to do it. And 
the train procedures do not grant you the authority to occupy the main line. And the other thing is it's easy to carry. It fits in your hip pocket or your, or your shirt pocket. Okay, I've, I've taken that and in order to uh, make paperwork easier to handle, I've, I have uh, I use eight and a half by 11 inch cardstock sheet. Um, one half of it you can see on the far right, that's the train procedure list. It's that one half of, uh, of uh, one, one page vertically. The other side of that page is the, is, uh, the name of the train. It's also got the decoder functions uh, listed and whistle signals. So that forms the front and the back of this thing. And then on the inside is a linearized timetable that's got everything the guy needs to know on that run about other scheduled trains. And I flip up the bottom to make a pocket and there's a linearized version of the entire railroad if somebody needs that. And in that, you insert the car cards and on the right ends up being the place to hang on to the uh, clearance cards and the train orders that the, uh, that particular crew may have. Okay, whoops, okay. The other thing that I've got for people that are new to timetable and train order, and, and regardless of the system, this is sort of the introduction to the thing. This I, I basically uh, borrowed straight from Mark Amfire who published it in the uh, October 2002 uh, Dispatcher's Office, which is the publication of the Operations Special Interest Group. And what this is, it's just a logic flow diagram that uh, helps you figure out if, if, you, if you've been assigned a train and you, you, aren't, and you, you can look it up on the timetable and say, okay, aha, there's my train right here. It's gonna tell you what class it is. So you can go down here, find out what your class is. And under that, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna there's yes and no and a series of things that you're gonna need to worry about. Uh, if you aren't in the in the uh, the employee timetable as a scheduled train, that means you're running extra, <laughs> and so you drop clear to the bottom. This means you're the lowest form of thing on the railroad, and there's a whole lot of things you need to watch out for. So usually, usually if you're getting started on this, the easiest way is to uh, uh, try and draw a train assignment that's a scheduled train that's going to be a first or second class train on that. By the time you get down to third class trains and in particular to extras, is, things get a little bit more complicated. But if you've got a, a, a good mentor along with you, you're, you're going to do fine. Okay, a couple of FAQs here. Uh, as far as timetable and train order, can you learn all this stuff in one session? And the, <laughs> our experience is nope. It's going to require a lot more study and practice. But the good news is you can certainly get a flavor for it in one section if you've got a good mentor along. Uh, can you fake it through a timetable and train order session? Um, that generally hasn't worked for people that try that. And, and the, the danger is if, you're, if you don't ask questions and you aren't listening to people, what you do is risk screwing up the session for everyone else. It's, it's much better to ask questions if you don't understand something or don't know. Um, can you enjoy or have fun on a timetable and train order session? Isn't this too much like, like work and rules? And the, and the answer is, I, I think it just depends on the attitude you go into with it. I always have a great time. And uh, most of the people that, that I know that operate this did it. I can tell you it took a couple of months working with the, the crew that are the regulars on the Durland branch for everybody to say, you know, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And in fact, this is kind of neat. And uh, like I said, right now, as we, we, we uh, were able to have some pretty good, pretty fun sessions. Um, the other thing that we discovered is, well, how about youngsters, teenagers? How do they fit in with this? Um, so I, I think great. My experience is, is having had uh, uh, started with a couple of 13 year olds uh, as part of the part of the crew when we were picking up timetable and train order. <laughs> These kids were, were sharper and better at it than the old had a long time modelers on this. They, I mean, they 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 learn like crazy mad, they remember things and they apply things and they want to do it right. So I, uh, if, 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 I wouldn't worry about uh, young folks getting involved in something like timetable and train order. They'll, they'll probably eat the stuff up. It's uh, like role playing or Dungeons and Dragons or something else. Um, so if your trend starts small, can you act as a host superintendent and dispatcher all, all at the same time? <laughs> Um, the answer is yes. 
uh, and that's if the layout's not too large or complex, and particularly if, if it's mechanically and electrically solid, uh, and uh, at least most of the crew is experienced. Yeah, then then a single person can wear three hats in all the management positions, <laughs> and and you can have a good session. Um, People say, well, don't I have to put in train order boards, telephones, and all kinds of other things? And the answer is no. Um, you, you, you can run just on voice communications on that. A uh, little magic goes out of it because everybody in the room gets to hear what uh, what's being called out, where a red board is being set, and where, where a train is when, when a train is OSing by a station. Uh, but on the other hand is, that's what we did on Jim Vale's railroad for, uh, for years. And it, uh, everybody had a good time, and it worked. Um, can, does, can you run a timetable session as smooth as they write them up in the magazines? <laughs> my experience is, is, yeah, once in a while, it actually does work out just like they write it up in the magazines. Other times are, uh, are a little more challenging. But it's, it's, it's all fun, and it's all learning, and uh, everybody keeps coming back. <laughs> So a little bit of info on TT and TO. Um, where do you learn about this stuff? Well, uh, you, you end up collecting things. There's a uh, model railroader had a column in it by Andy Sprandio while he was still alive called The Operators. And he wrote a number of columns on bits and pieces of timetable and train order. So if you got access to the uh, MRs on, online at, at Kalmbach or wherever it is, uh, it, it'd be worthwhile to go back and find those columns by Andy. They were usually the, uh, the well, no, Tony's got the last page. They were before the last page in there. Now, since Andy died, um, Jerry Zinzik has picked up a similar one-page column called uh, On Operations, and Jerry's also covered a number of points on timetable and train order operations. And uh, like I said, that, that reading that stuff would be a real good beginning. Otherwise, uh, what you see up at the top are, uh, these are Real, real rule books that you get it uh, off of eBay. You find them in uh, antique and shops and things of this sort. Uh, on the right are more of the same here. These are actually rule, rule examination books that uh, I found in antique shops, you know, when we're on vacations and things like that. And they're uh, timetable and train order is timetable and train order. So whether the thing was published in the 1800s <laughs> or, or newer is the basics are still pretty much the same through there. Um, getting a hold of employee timetables is always a worthwhile effort. Um, prototype paperwork to find out how do these guys really write these things. You know, you can see what a form of an order is in the rule book, but how, how did the dispatcher actually dictate that and how did the agent operator actually copy this thing down and how did they string orders together. So these are all places you can look to find this. Otherwise, uh, you come back has published several things here that are also helpful. Uh, and the, the uh, operations special interest group uh, published an entire book on timetable and trainer order operation. It's really two sections. One of them is all prototype stuff and is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough read. Uh, the other part is adapting it to model railroads, and uh, that's a much a much easier read there. So a couple of recommendations. So if you aren't into operations or you haven't tried, tried timetable and train order, but that's what your what your prototype did, I, I would just encourage you to get started. Take it slow. Lives aren't at stake, and you don't want to burn out trying to do it all at once because that that would be a heavy lift. Uh, and work on those parts of operation that most interest you. And uh, over time, your knowledge and skills are, are, are going to evolve, and you're going to go back and be able to tackle the parts that uh, you, you, were, you were a little bit more afraid of. And the other thing is, is I'd, I'd stay grounded in the prototype all, all that you can and take your liberties from there. Um, and, and this is, that way you're only, you know, one one, one step away from what the real guys did versus, uh, somebody took this in the prototype, modified it to do that. Somebody took it, modified it again and again, and ear out. And at that point is, what do you have? Well, if it all works out, you've got an operating system that works for you. Is it time? Is it timetable and train order? If you were trying to emulate that, the answer is, well, it might not be. But at any rate, it, it, the choice is yours on how you want to do that. 
Uh, the other thing is I would look into the uh, what the operations special interest group has to offer in this area. Uh, there's far more far more standard gauge guys I can tell you into into prototype operations than than there are narrow gauge guys at the moment. And the last thing is operate early and often. And uh, at this point, I'll conclude. Uh, looking forward to many more years of uh, of operations. Hey, thank you, Dave. That was great. Okay. Uh, we had a comment from Mike Condor. Okay. Um, Condor, rather. Uh, he said, can these documents be shared in the files section of the group site? They're very hard to read here. And I guess that's well, an, a question for you or Russ. Yeah, I, I, I can certainly, yeah, I, I can put up a PDF of the slideshow I just ran. That that wouldn't be a problem. Great. Uh, yes, op maybe. yes. operations is kind of a, a big deal amongst a lot of us now. And uh, we will sure make room for, or make that happen in the files uh, for any, uh, for uh, what Dave is willing to share and any others, uh, mm -hmm. we can get a pretty good discussion going online uh, okay. through the, through the, uh, the messages. Yeah, does, it, it does anybody else have a question for Dave? Uh, if, if so, press your space bar down and go ahead and ask. Let me interject, Pete. This is, yeah. Mark. I was uh, private messaging uh, with Mike. Uh, not just the PowerPoint, but the uh, uh, documents that you were showing uh, in your oh. PowerPoint, Dave, is what he was looking for. Oh, you, you, you bet. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and put up uh, some of those now. So I'll put those up as Word files because then people can take them and hack them to their heart's content on that. Um, you know, for the current timetable I'm running now, which is timetable number five, yeah, you know, so I can put up the stuff that I use to generate that. I can put up some examples of the train folders. Um, I've got 23 different train folders. And <laughs> I'll also put up some examples of, uh, of, of train lineups. So even though we run the same, uh, let's see, we're timetable number 5A. So we've had six timetables issued since, since 1997. And no two sessions have ever been the same. We'll run with a given timetable for a number of years. I'll only change that if I've done something major to the railroad that basically uh, drastically changes how we want to do things. And the last time that happened was uh, four years ago when I added added more staging. And so that allowed us to get uh, get some more stuff on the line. So we had to revise the uh, the employee timetable to handle that. And, uh, and away we go. But no, I'll be more than happy to put that up. Uh, anybody wants this stuff as I'm, you know, I don't own any, co any copyrights, licenses or anything else. And uh, if it helps you out, that's great. Burr Stewart says, is there an operating operating plan document to share with operators who or are train instructions all they need? Um, so if you're a crew, you're called for a run. So the, what you get is the, uh, is the, um, it is the train folder and, and that that plus, you know, some knowledge of timetable and trainer rules. Uh, and, you know, in my case, how to use car cards is really all you need. The guys that need the uh, need the lineups is a dispatcher because he's got to, he's got to get things and clear up trains, get them on the road and uh, handle extras on that. So he needs the big up picture. And the other guy that needs a more limited picture is the yard master at Shaman. So he needs to know what extras are being called out of Chama, uh, when things are going to be hitting or not. And so, yeah, I do have paperwork for that, but the uh, the rest of the crew doesn't see any of that. And that's similar to what the real Grand did. I mean, they, they would communicate from Alamosa to Chama saying, okay, tomorrow here's what we're going to run on cruise rest is get these guys out, make two turns to do this. You know, did the crew see that? No, it was the agent operator in there that was doing that. And then the crew callers that woke these guys up after they had their, <laughs> their required rest and said, you're called for, you know, extra whatever it is east at such and such a time. Okay, thanks, Dave. We hope you enjoyed this. We look forward to seeing you again. The next session will be posted on the group's IONNG several days before the next program. Look for the link there.